It's member-supported Hawaii Public Radio, and all things considered, I'm Dave Lawrence, and uh, thrilled we're having a, uh, a little get-together here with a band that are in town through Sunday at the Blue Note Hawaii. It's the average white band. I'm joined by uh, two original remaining members of the group. It's a real thrill. We've got Alan Gorey, guitarist and also bass guitarist and vocalist, Ani McIntyre, and uh, guitarist and vocalist with the band. Aloha, Alan. Uh, mahalo. <laughs> and aloha, Ani. Mahalo. Good to have you here. And, you, and right? y- you did get it right. Mahalo. It sounded good, too. Mahalo. It sounded very good. Uh, you emphasized the second syllable. Uh, yeah, however you... Uh, mahalo. 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 <laughs> mahalo for mahalo your uh, for your time. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> a different era. Yeah, I look. remember getting a fruit bowl from Tom Moffat when we did the, the HIC arena for the first time, and it, it said, Aloha and Mahalo from Hawaii loves you or something like that on 1976 was that that and that was your first time and then on stage i heard you say something uh 30 years ago was your last time here Um, 38 38 38 years ago believe it or not wow so it was at 78 then is that the last time we played in in honolulu so you did two some reading into it you a couple how many did you do how many before that last one did you do several the hic say again we did two um, before that at the HIC, which is now called something else. Blaisdell Arena. There you go. And uh, 75 and 76, I think. The second, the second time was with uh, Tom Moffat. Okay. Well, yeah, and he's still doing some shows, too. Oh, that's great. Yeah, Tom is still, Tom's still doing, doing some stuff. Yeah, give, him, give him our regards because he's uh, an old friend and a, and a great promoter. You know, he's, he's the real deal, you know. Any particular memories or experiences from those shows that stick out? And nothing we could repeat on the air probably but uh, there were well yes I'll tell you one one was repeatable and this is um, a historic moment in band in any band's history the night we sat in a restaurant and watched the manager smash the place up in front of us at Nick's Fish Market oh wow it's right around the corner from where I live and uh, Mark who was the manager we'd been at a party at his house the night before and I think he was still blitzed the next night so we were sitting at this long table and he came in and proceeded to demolish the place rockstar style and we, we sat there going There's something wrong with this picture <laughs> we're supposed to be Keith Moon you're supposed to be throwing us out <laughs> it was a, a moment in time that is, uh, that's definitely an unusual, so as manager of the restaurant, trash yeah, in the yeah, place, yeah, maybe yeah. for a little in- insurance purposes. Any memories uh, on your end, Ani, that stick out? Yeah, no, it was just, I had one. Hard to top that, huh? <laughs> it is, I mean, if you remember it, you weren't there. Right. But anyway, um, no, a great time, absolutely great time. I, I, I loved Hawaii the first uh, couple of times over here and went to um, Maui and, and hung out and some of us played golf and some of us went um on surfboards and did all sorts of strange things. I went out to sea one time on a, 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 catam- a catamaran and I, I fell asleep and I drifted way, way out. And Alan remembers um, seeing me, this, this tiny dot in the distance. Did you call for rescue? Not quite. I managed to get back, but the day before, which I didn't know about, there was a whale in the same area. Which might have been rather interesting. Right, yeah, sometimes uh, as adorable as they are, they can be a little di- difficult yeah. if you get too close. Um, but one, but great, a great time. Yeah, and it's, a, it's great that you're back and you've got an extended run. This is cool for people in the islands. A lot of different folks have been checking in with us saying that they're excited to, to have you uh, back in the islands. And, and I had not realized uh, that the, the gap in your last date had been so long. Um, your set list, if you can, you, there's uh, R&B, latest record. Uh, I was listening to uh, the mention of it on the stage. And, and if you can kind of paint a picture for folks who are interested in coming out to the shows, how you run through your set list and maybe how you put it together with the kind of uh, uh, discography that you've got. Well, it's a combination of, um, on, a, on a first night especially, because you're not quite sure what the makeup of the audience is going to be. So it's guesswork on night one. And since we have two shows, we try and just make it a little different each show. Instead of doing the same show twice, uh, even though it's not the same audience twice, um, we, we, we change things around just so we don't go nuts. You know, we, we get to try and play as many things as possible on the night. So this this tour this um week here we're trying to make sure we we play everything that's on the uh, awb r&b cd which was after all a live recording from austin texas last november one of those lucky nights where we got it all in one take Mm. one night no 
overdubs, no anything. I mean, I think we fixed one or two things in the studio because of a couple of squeals and um, technical things, not because of playing or lack thereof. It was, it was just, I mean, it was a magic night. Normally when you do a live album, you'll record four, five, six nights, and then you have agonizing month in the studio picking which takes from which yeah. night to, to combine into the, the finished piece. And we were really, really lucky and got the whole thing in, 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 one, in one set, you know. Um, very, very lucky. And, and that's, that's what the album is. And we're trying to play all of that um, throughout the five nights that we're here. You know, we'll play all these tunes. We'll sure. play a whole lot more than that. But we, we have to keep ourselves interested as well. So we, we chop and change from, from set to set. And again, it's a case of figuring out what the demographic might be and what they're going to enjoy most. And tonight, really, we just tried to play as broad a, a spectrum as we could for the first set so we could see what the feedback was and sort of we'll base the second set on some of that. That's a smart way to do it. And it's an unusual oh, crowd here in Waikiki because uh, you've got tourists, you've got local people. It's a bit of a... Uh, well, it's like that in uh, in B.B. King's in New York right. where you're... Um, um, I mean, all you could... An, an, and analogize that this is kind of the uh, Times Square of uh, Honolulu here in this bit of Waikiki. It seems that way to me with the amount of uh, tourists and everybody around. So there's bound to be some of that walk up, um, people coming in going, who the hell are they? I've not heard of them before. <laughs> we just need a stage deli if we're going to make it like a Times Square. <laughs> <laughs> it's closed and so is the Carnegie closed last week. Closed for good? For good. Really? Oh my Lord. Yeah, it, it closed... Uh, uh, this this past week, the Carnegie went down. I mean, it's been running on empty for the last six or nine months or something. But um, now that's it. He's, he's, he's gone. He's no more. I used to love my half sours over at that uh, at that place, the uh, yeah. the pickles. Where the hell are we going to get our calories? Right. <laughs> it's really called the Calorie Deli, really. <laughs> When I think about, uh, you mentioned being interested in, in, for you know, have to be interested in it to play and, and keep yourself interested and use it, utilize the set list in that way. Uh, when you think about your development to be a musician, going back to being a kid, uh, we'll start with you, Ani. The, the first ways that music became a part of your life and that influenced you to then pick up an instrument and devote yourself to it for what has been a remarkable career. I don't remember, you know, suddenly realizing that music was is it it's always been there and it's all i ever wanted to do who was exposing it to you first uh, my mother she was uh, she played piano and um she, she had to practice because she was um she took up um she'd studied in school and uh and at the athenaeum in glasgow um for her lram london royal music course uh the depression killed that so she couldn't do that but she she just loved to play in front of people and for people, especially children. And um, she took up um, country, she got a, a gig playing for country dance music. And I would come home from school and, you know, the ornaments would be bouncing off the, <laughs> <laughs> off the, off the shelves because she would be doing all this. And it's, you know, Scottish country dance music is very rhythmical. It's all about dancing and, and, you know, it's just everything's very, very rhythmical and and, and, staccato. and staccato and um, a lot of energy right. and a lot of notes she had to play. So she really had to practice hard because the gigs were like for maybe three hours nonstop, and um, and people had to dance to it. So it was a strict tempo. And Scottish music is a very strict tempo. So I, I, that was my, really my first influence of, of music. And then, of course, when rock and roll broke when I was about 12, Alan would remember that, about 1956, when, you know, Elvis came out and Little Richard. And, and it was, I was just, there was no, there was no qu question. Elvis came out to your house. <laughs> he did. I mean, he came in, the closest he got was Presswick Airport. <laughs> he stopped off at Presswick Airport on his way to Germany in 1960, you know. And... Um, you know, rock and roll was it for me. What made you want to pick up the uh, the guitar? Just listening to radio. And, and How old were you when you were? Twelve. Twelve years old. Yeah, on my twelfth birthday, I got a guitar. And as that is, that's an age when a lot of folks actually had that had that opportunity. Uh, yourself, what do you think, Alan, in terms of pivotal moments? And, and maybe, as uh, Ani pointed to mom, if you can point to a figure or figures that were influential in this process. Well, in my case, it was my dad. He, he was a piano player. 
uh, too. And he uh, he was a band leader in in Perth in Scotland, and uh, he was also the arranger. Um, he transcribed. In those days, it was all sheet music, so he he would sit up way into the small hours transcribing for. Uh, violins and alto sax and you know whatever because they were all in different keys so he would take the the piano copy and transcribe everything uh, so he'd be burning the midnight oil doing that and uh, I I could never sleep when he was doing that so I kept kind of wandering in and going you still up right okay this is what you do and I'd go and sit at the rehearsals and things like that on a Sunday afternoon and, and just watch how it was done not taking any notice really right. of how it was done but it eventually seeped in that uh, you know band leading is run, runs in the family <laughs> and uh, that's that's it he was a jazz fanatic you know he was um uh, fats waller art tatum you know james p johnson all that stuff and and the big the big bands of the time and, and ellington and basie and all that stuff so those were the records that i grew up with so really uh, the, the r&b of its day you know was that was my background and that's been a, it's a good segue into, you know, average white band. You're known for this funk sound that it, it caught people's eye, certainly the makeup of the band, but obviously something had caught your ear that you guys gravitated in the direction that you did. If you can kind of describe how, because, you know, I hear the rock and roll thing from Ani, and I hear some mention of, of, of jazz from you, but talk about how you begin to dial in the sound on what uh, you became really known for, which was basically funk. Yes, uh, funk, but melodic funk, um, with, with a, lot of, um, uh, a lot of craft in the writing, in the, in the, in the, um, the lyrical sense. And it, it wasn't just, you know, boop, da, da, bump, everybody do the bump. You know, there was a lot of that at that time. Mm -hmm. we, we, we never wanted to just kind of stay in that channel. We always wanted to make it something that was, that was much more rounded. And that's probably because we were white guys from Scotland. We, we had a different take on doing the R&B thing. But, I mean, if you think of all the, the influences that we had, the Isley Brothers, Marvin Gaye, um, all these people, Stevie Wonder, and so on and so on, even Stevie Winwood and the great singers from over there, all, all these guys were of a kind, of an R&B kind. And then you throw in James Brown, it's like throwing gunpowder into the mix. Mm. It was like throwing a, a, a grenade in. That's what kicked us into, into top gear. All of us, whatever other things we loved, we all loved James Brown and the JBs. And that was kind of the template that we hung the, the core of the band on. And all the other things were our influences from, as I say, Marvin and Stevie and Isley Brothers and Al Green and and and, and, and the Beatles and John and Paul. Uh, some of the two of the greatest singers of all time. Uh, two, one of the greatest duos there will, there will ever be. Those two guys Vocalist. singing together. Yeah, vocalists. Yeah. Add to yeah. people for, people forget that, that they were such good vocalists. You know, and is soulful. it and soulful and so they were an R and B band, same as we are. We are an R and B band, and but they wrote about John and Paul. John and Paul, absolutely. Um, the the their influences were the same as what we did, but we came to them. We came to what we our music through them. But um, talking about getting back to James Brown, um, coming back from school one day and I, uh, I went to a friend's house and he said, you got to listen to this record. And it was James Brown live at the Apollo, 1962. Right. The first, and I've never been the same since. It's a life-changing record for a lot of folks. It certainly was for me. You know, I'd, I'd come up with the rock thing and, you know, because that was what was coming up at the time and that was the age I was at the time. When I heard James Brown, it changed everything. It was all about space and groove and, you know, and, and discipline. And then when we put this band together, Robbie was uh, original drummer. That was his whole thing, was, was, was um, stick to the groove. You find a groove and you stick to it. And I used to look, try and speed up. And he said, didn't you speed up? Stay where it is. Keep it down. What do you play that for? Leave spaces. It was all about spaces. You know, you, you play a few notes and you leave a space. And somebody said that, but recently I heard uh, an interview and they were talking about uh, Miles Davis. Miles didn't play blah, 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 all the time. It's all about spaces and finding the right note at the right time. And that, that, that is what it's all about. And if you combine that with the, what James did, and he wasn't a great musician. He wasn't a musician at all, really, but he, but he just had a, a vision of what the sound should be. And God, 
life-changing. Well, there's a lot to that sound. I just had the band Hiroshima on. Uh, they were on a few different times recently, and uh, Dan Kuramoto, the leader, was talking about something that Dizzy had told him, and it was very much about it's what you're not playing. That it's it's that that uh, and it's it's hard to paraphrase, but I know as you're speaking, I know precisely the the kind of uh, sentiment you were talking about because the silence and the space in between the notes is a huge. It's a, it, it sets the next note up. It's 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 what sets up what you're playing is exactly. what you're not playing. So exactly. I, I, it makes a lot of sense. Huh? It's hard to do that. Um, right. That's a very hard thing to yeah. do. Yeah, uh, you've got to be very very confident to be able to do that to hold back and. Right. Leave the space. That's where Robbie really taught us, as a band. You know, well, he he had had uh, a, an education that we hadn't. He had been with a group that backed a lot of the um, visiting American R and B acts through Europe: Benny King, Garnet Mims, uh, the Drifters, um, a, a few more that whose names I can Edwin Starr, and several others. He was in the backing band, so he. 16 years old and he was getting whipped to death by these band leaders the black band leaders from new york or wherever and they were like they were kicking his ass and you know so he by the time he was 18 he was a seasoned you know uh, chitlin circuit pro mm. we were older than him but he knew 10 times as much as us so he he came in with that whole um space discipline thing and it's the same as writing lyrics it's what you don't write that that makes a song a song as opposed to just a piece of uh, script, a piece of writing. You know, it's, it's no, no longer a libretto. It's, it's an actual, it's, it's a piece of funk. They look at uh, person to person. Um, we sat in a little cupboard at the corner of the studio, Hamish and I, and rat, rat, ro- root, root the lyrics in about 20 minutes because they were, they were, these guys were waiting for us to put down a vocal. We didn't have anything. We just had the title person to person, face to face, right? So, you know, we, we wrote down our ideas and then Hamish had the good sense to leave most of them out. He just said, um, telephone line, bad connection, and I'm half asleep. And it's just these little thoughts. All the uh, buts and ands and ifs and so we, he left, we left them out. And it, it was genius because it was what you don't put in that made the sentences work as a song as opposed to a piece of, um, you know, a script. Yeah, and it gives it a unique syntax is also what you're talking that's about the, uh, yeah, when you yeah. do stuff like that with the music. And that's a great that's example. When you pay for your problems, syntax. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a tax somewhere. <laughs> There's plenty of taxes out there. A guy, we've talked a little bit about rock stuff uh, being uh, a, a factor in, in the relationship to your sound. And, and there's also, uh, I was hoping you could fill in the blanks on how uh, 73, I guess it was, Clapton, you, it's credited that era. And I guess who was the guy? It was uh, Bruce McCaskill was the, the manager who assisted in, in getting you guys a spot that would end up being important uh, for your development. Yeah, Bruce McCaskill, and uh, to his credit, Robin Turner, who had been um, with, he was uh, Robert Stigwood's right-hand man. He was our actual manager at the time in, in London uh, in the early days, in, in their formative days. He, of course, and Bruce had been, Bruce McCaskill had been Eric's roadie. He'd, he'd been with uh, Eric through the Derek and the Dominoes period and the Delaney and Bonnie stuff and everything. So Bruce... Um, uh, Bruce facilitated quite a lot of that, and he was he was responsible for bringing us to the states. But yeah, the seventy three was the um, the Rainbow concert, Eric Eric's reintroduction to the music business, and of course everybody from the music business in London was there. Everybody, uh, and a whole lot of people from the states flew in for that gig. You know, who were all in the audience. I mean, if 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 the spotlights hadn't been so bright, we would have crapped ourselves when we'd seen who was in the audience honestly McCartney was in the audience Lennon was in the we didn't see them because you know the lights are there thank goodness otherwise we, we would have you know would have made the, the gig a lot more difficult it would have yeah as, as it was we had a friend of ours who was a DJ and he'd set up his turntables and everything in our dressing room so we we had our own disco sort of going backstage it was a wild night it was fantastic Say it. From, we get complaints from the stage manager because we were too loud. We were drowning out the band that was on. <laughs> we were distracting the band, you know, Clapton's band that was on, who was led by Pete Townsend, who, you know, put the thing together for for Eric. Eric had been out of commission for a couple of years due to his um, problems. Little realizing right. that he was really launching the average white band at the same <laughs> time. <laughs> and that's how stuff like that happens sometimes. Sometimes it'll be like that. Yeah, it does. It happens. Yeah, it is serendipity. Absolutely. 
We mentioned JB and and uh, big fan myself. Um, and it was uh, an honor to get to see him several different times uh, when he was alive, and God bless him. Um, but uh, I understand. Uh, pick up the pieces, got the attention of the JBs, and then they sort of return the favor in a way. I mean, not, not a lot. And that has happened throughout music. There will be times when other bands get referenced or songs get referenced, but that had to make you feel really special. Everybody, everybody borrows from everyone else. Absolutely. And we were so influenced by James. And, and um, when pick up the pieces, you know, when the melody idea came up for it, you know, we, 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 everybody just automatically played the parts that we thought would fit. And it was obviously like, like JB's tribute to pass the peas, right. pick up the pieces, pass the peas. That's where Alan got the idea for the, the pick up the pieces title, which was just a chant like the JB's would do. Mm -hmm. Pass the peas, pass the peas. You know. Fred Maceo. You know, absolutely. Monsters. Maceo is a you know, huge hero of, our, of ours. And it was um, really the JB's that um, influenced us an awful lot. And then they they did that tune as like the the uh, pick up the pieces. Well, the funny thing was that um, when we met the the JBs um, and when they came to New York, Hamish and I went down to the the, the Lone Star Cafe, and we, we, we met James, which was amazing, you know. And he came out and said hello and appreciated what we were doing and all the rest of it. And then the rest of the band came out and they were saying, you know, when pick up the pieces came out, everybody thought it was us. And they've gone, like the JBs, and the JBs have gone, hey, ain't us, it's some Scottish guys. Right. <laughs> it's some white band from Scotland. <laughs> and that was uh, sort of the name of the band I read. It came from a British diplomat, Rab Wiper, is that true? That's correct, yeah. Whether he was the first to use it or not, I'm not sure, but um, he had a, a, a phrase or saying that was a comparative for like he'd been in, you know, he'd been in station in Bangkok. How is Bangkok, Rab? Oh, it's too hot for the average white man. Uh, so the average white man was a, a phrase that was sort yeah. of bandied around our whole collective. And um, when we were fumbling and stumbling for a name, um, it, why don't we, you know, you can't call a band that. Well, maybe we could. Since we don't play average white rock music, it would be a, a, a nice I irony to, you know, let's try it. And, and we did. And apparently it worked. That's really a uh, that's a neat way to have have had something come come to be. Um, are you taking a look at a? Yeah, no problem with that. Um, so uh, I think about <clears throat> there was a uh, collaborative record that you guys got to do, Benny and us, um, Benny King. Um, you talk a little bit about how that came to be. Benny was uh, one of the artists that Robbie worked with, so in a way, it was uh, a sort of. A, a, a late um, tribute to Robbie that we wanted to do the record with Benny. We did a single, that Atlantic. It was their idea to do uh, Star in the Ghetto. So we did this single with Benny down in uh, Florida while we were making another album. Our album wasn't going so well. I mean, we were running out of ideas. We were, we were like a riverbed. We're drying up because we're on the road all the time. Atlantic wanted more records. You can't tour to promote the last one and write another one. It, it, the, the two things do not go together, you know. It, it's, uh, Picasso might have been able to do it, but he could, he could paint in his sleep. But you know, it was, it was difficult. And um, so this, this worked out so well, this one session, we said, let's do an album and just go and have fun. So we all got on a plane, went up to New York to Atlantic Studios. And in two weeks, we cut this entire album with Benny. Um, which was wonderful. It was great fun for him. It reintroduced him to a younger audience through through our audience, and we got a taste of working with Benny, who was such a beautiful soul, wonderful guy, great musician and singer. And um, you know, we saw why Robbie why Robbie had such an affection for him. You know, so we he I mean, honestly, Robbie was sitting on our shoulders while we made that record, and that was one of the joys of doing it. You know, you have any particular memories that stick out that you want to share from doing that record? The, the the fact that we did the album in Atlantic um, Studios was, was a huge thing. Um, but also that um, Luther was on the album as well, which was, uh, and he, I mean, he wasn't really that well known. At the Luther time. Vandross? Luther Vandross, and, uh, and his ideas um, during the session for, for vocal ideas were just amazing. Never mind his, you know, his vocal input and everything. So that was uh, also introduced um, Alex Lidgerwood, 
who is uh, from Glas you know, Glasgow. Right. Went on to be with Santana. Yeah, yeah, went on to be with Santana. I mean, I saw him in 1965 in a little club in in, uh, in Glasgow, and they hear, uh, he started singing, and I went, here's my back in it. Right. Stood up. Mind-boggling vocal. Holy crap, who is this guy? Yeah. You know, absolutely amazing. So um, th- th- that really stands out. And it was nice to be able to do songs that um, they were, you know, Benny made famous, you know, so... Oh, it's a huge testament to who you guys were too, and it's a it's a you know one just one of many parts of a remarkable career. Uh, Alan Gorey, Ani McIntyre, it's Average White Band uh, spending some time here with me uh, during their run at the Blue Note in Waikiki, which is going on through Sunday. Hope you had fun chatting today. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, we could go on for hours like this. Actually, it's this is a lot of fun because revisiting the influences and the things that have brought us this far. And to be back here after all this time, it's, it's kind of like bringing things full circle. So thanks for the opportunity. Uh, you're quite welcome. Hope you had fun, Annie. Absolutely. It's been great. Thank you very much. You are welcome.